good evening, everyone. Welcome to the college. This is what we call a cozy, intimate group, so I'm looking forward to this evening. Tonight's speaker is part of our celebration of Black History Month, where we bring national experts on topics that explore issues of access and equity that affect our community. Here at Lane, as, as the president, it's my honor to bring you Mayor Karen Freeman Wilson, someone who's dedicated her life to improving the quality of the lives of others. She's recognized expert and a powerful vehicle for change in her, in her community. It's my hope that the students that are here as well as the community members are, will all be highly motivated by her messages. Tonight's presentation is sponsored by the Lane Foundation's Roberta Connie Endowment Fund as a means to engage the campus and community in our vision to transform lives through learning. We're honored to have members of our board here tonight. Board Chair Rosie Pryor, would you say hello? We have Mayor Venice here. Mayor, say hello. Anyone else in, in the area? Any other elected officials? We have our... Um, Chris, the husband of Rosie, and also <laughs> commissioner, <laughs> county commissioner, excuse me. I don't know if you're a husband first or a commissioner. <laughs> oh. All right, you, you threw me off there, folks. Uh, following tonight's presentation, there's going to be a brief question and answer period. And special thanks to our own Greg Evans. Greg, please stand. Take a bow. And our events coordinator, Marcia Sills, for, who helped us put all tonight's event together. We appreciate it. We do. So here tonight to introduce Ms. Freeman Wilson is Mr. Greg Williams, Evans, excuse me, Lane Community College's uh, Associate Vice President for Equity and Access. Enjoy tonight. Thank you, President Hamilton. I, I could be Greg Williams, but, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, I, I don't want to steal his thunder. Um, it's indeed a pleasure tonight to um, introduce a colleague, a friend, uh, someone that I deeply admire and respect, uh, clearly an overachiever, because um, <laughs> the mayor, Mayor Freeman Wilson and I are both uh, from the same generation. And uh, her resume is just, will just blow you away. Um, Mayor Karen Freeman Wilson um, from Gary, Indiana, is a political pioneer, an advocate uh, in the national drug court movement, and one of the leaders in the National League of Cities. She is first vice president of the National League of Cities this year. Next year, she will be president of that organization, which is the chief lobbying arm for cities around our nation. And what we do in the halls of state governments all across the nation and in Washington, D.C. is critical to um, what we do in our survival here, uh, not only as cities, but also tangentially uh, the education community, and in particular, uh, what we do as community colleges here. Uh, Mayor Freeman Wilson is a graduate of Harvard College and also a graduate of Harvard Law School. Uh, she was a defense attorney and then went into went to the other side and became a municipal court judge. That's where she found her stride and her stroke in terms of drug court. So she was one of the first people um, in the early on in the drug court movement to start a drug court in Gary, Indiana, uh, one that is successful and has been modeled around the nation, uh, similar to many efforts that we have here locally, both on the federal and the local level. Um, Mayor Freeman Wilson was also Attorney General of the state of Indiana, the first African-American woman to hold that position, and later she became, she was elected mayor of Gary, Indiana to become the first African-American woman to hold that position. Now she may or may not tell you this, but she had to try three times before <laughs> she got there, but says the last time was the easiest time to get there. So we are deeply honored and pleased to have Mayor Karen Freeman Wilson here tonight 
to speak to you about the issues of education versus incarceration. One of the things that has plagued the African American community for the last 30 years. And immediately following her talk, she's going to take questions and answers from the audience. And so please give your attention to Mayor Karen Freeman Wilson. Good evening. This, let's see, how's that? Yeah, that's great. All right, because it's almost as tall as I am. <laughs> First and foremost, uh, let me say to President March Hamilton, as well as to our chair, uh, chair of the board, and uh, counselor, chair prior, counselor prior, and to um, all of you, particularly my friend Greg Evans, it's uh, a, a real honor and privilege to join you here in Eugene, Oregon at Lane Community College. Um, you all have been such gracious hosts and uh, it has been just um, a pleasure to be here. I hate that I have to leave so early in the morning and, uh, and, you know, I know that this country is a big place. There are so many people that you could invite to stand where I'm standing. And the fact that you have chosen to invite me to this speaker series, I am extremely humbled and uh, count it a, a unique privilege to share with you today. I'll do my best not to be boring. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, what I'm hoping is that we can have a, um, a dialogue. Greg uh, talked earlier about my work with the National League of Cities, and I can tell you that one of the greatest pleasures of, of being involved with and working on behalf of the National League of Cities is to get to know folks like Greg and Betty Taylor and others who have been such trailblazers and advocates in their respective fields. Um, Greg is one of the foremost leaders in the country, as you know, in the area of transportation. And we rely heavily on his counsel. And I just want to thank him in front of you because uh, I know that sometimes when he's going to Washington, you wonder, what's he going there for again? But it's because he is providing the leadership that we sorely need. And to come and see the rapid transit and all of the cutting edge things that you've done in the space of transportation is a real encouragement to me as we begin to embark on that in Gary, Indiana. So um, about two weeks ago, I had the opportunity to share with a group of four mayors, uh, Mayor Mitch Landrew from New Orleans, Mayor Michael Hancock from Denver, Colorado, and Mayor um, Marty Walsh from Boston, Massachusetts. And we were being interviewed by David Axelrod. And as we were talking, I said, you know, I just hate CNN. <laughs> and he said, well, you know, I'm on CNN. <laughs> I said, yeah, I know that. And, and I thought about how, and it was during the course of the conversation, and I thought about how it came up, especially after the reporter in the room reported it. And, um, many people heard about it. It was tweeted about and talked about. And it wasn't, you know, so I began to explain it. I said, it's not that I hate CNN. In fact, I think it's probably one of the most responsible uh, cable news programming uh, sources. I don't like the discourse generally that's going on in our country. And there seems to be so much contentiousness 
And the other thing that frustrates me is, you know, how many ways can you say the same thing? Um, even if you do it from all of these different sides. And so that is the source of my frustration. The fact that we seem to be so quick to castigate each other and to marginalize each other and to alienate and to really um, focus so easily on the differences that we have and the things that we don't have in common and the things that we disagree with rather than to find the common ground. I was recently asked, how do you function as a Democrat in a legislature that has a supermajority in both chambers of Republicans and a governor who is Republican? And what I say to them consistently, it's not that there aren't things that we disagree on. There are quite a few, to be honest. But there are so many places, so many ways for us to work together, addressing the opioid epidemic in our state, helping to be, bring young people to out of school time programs and summer jobs, providing job training for those who need to take their skills to the next level, providing opportunities and avenues for post-secondary education, understanding that you cannot arrest your way out of problems and that incarceration only provides um, short-term faulty solutions. So there's so many things that we agree on. What does it do or how does it help anyone for us to focus on those things that we disagree on? Why would I do that? And so it's possible. There are times that you get frustrated. I'll admit that. But more often than not, we're able to find the common ground. And so as we think about the challenges that we have in our country, whether you talk about health care, whether you talk about mental health challenges, whether you talk about the rampant gun violence, whether you talk about the challenges around immigration and how we have created this discourse that lacks just basic courtesy. You know, when most of us were coming up, our parents taught us just basic things. Please, thank you, don't cut people off when they're talking, be nice. And somehow, we've replaced that with this confrontational discourse that does nothing but keep us on edge. So I would suggest that as I think about how do we get from this place, which I would say as an adult is probably one of the lowest places that we've been collectively as a country. How do we get from this place to a much better place? How do we create, quite frankly, a better example for our children and their children. And I would say, how do we learn from them as well? So I thought about what gives me hope. How do you get 
hope for the future? Where, where does that come from? And I thought about my experience in drug treatment court. I came to the bench in 1996, and um, I was a municipal court judge, and I don't know if you've ever seen the show, those of you who are in my age group have seen it, Night Court. <laughs> that was my courthouse. That was my courtroom. Uh, there was a barrel of laughs during every court call. But there was something that um, struck me very soon after I took the bench. And it was simply that I was seeing the same people over and over and over again. Eddie Lipscomb, Laura Dooley. I mean, I can still call the names, and that was back in, in 1996. And so I thought to myself, this is clearly a pattern. I know that folks aren't coming back because they like the accommodations. <laughs> we have to do something different. Around that same time, I had the good fortune of running into a woman by the name of Caroline Cooper, who was a uh, PhD from American University. She was one of the early leaders in the drug court movement, and she came to Gary on a technical assistance visit for some of the other programs that were running on the city side, or at least um, through the mayor's office. And she just start, decided to stop in and see me. And she said to me, she said, you should think about starting a drug treatment court. And I said, I've never heard of it. Tell me more about it. And she said, well, it's a way that allows judges and prosecutors and those who are traditionally in the court system to look at some of the underlying issues that cause people to commit crimes and that drive people into the criminal justice system and the family dependency system, the juvenile justice system, and all of the court systems. I said, that sounds intriguing. I'm interested. But I'm going on vacation, so when I get back, I'll call you. She said, well, where are you going? Well, I'm going to San Bernardino, California. She said, guess what? One of the foremost drug courts is right in San Bernardino. I said, OK, well, I'll stop in. Can you set it up? She said, sure, I will. So you can imagine my husband's <laughs> response when I told him on the first day of our vacation, oh, honey, I'm going down to the court. I'll be right back. It won't take an hour. And then I arrived back four hours later. It took four hours because even today, some 22 years later, it was by far one of the most transformative experiences that I have ever had professionally. I thought I was a good judge. I processed cases every day. I greeted, greeted people with a smile, even when I was giving them time. That'll be 60 days in the Gary City Jail. I was pleasant. But for the first time, I saw a judge interacting with people that were before him. How are you doing today? How's your son? I know he got in trouble at school. Did you get that worked out? I see that you've been clean for 12 weeks. Great job. I see that you had a positive test last year, last week. 
What do you think caused that? What can we do to help you get back on track? These were the conversations, but the one that I will always remember was the interview for one of the recent graduates. And we were all sitting in the judge's chambers and he was talking to this recent drug court graduate and she said, hey, uh, he said, uh, one of the case managers told me that you hadn't quite found employment yet. Is that correct? Are you still having a hard time? And she said, yes. He said, now, I remember that you're a cashier, that you've been a cashier at grocery stores or retail stores. She said, yep, that's what I used to do. I've done it. Even throughout my addiction, I've always been able to maintain employment. And the judge picked up the phone. He called the head of uh, one of the largest grocery store chains in the L.A. area. He said, hey, sitting here with one of my recent graduates, she needs a job working in a grocery store. Can you help us out? And the person on the other end, I couldn't hear him, but he must have said yes because the judge wrote something down and said, go to the chain or the branch on whatever that street was and see the manager and they'll give you a job. Now, during the course of this conversation, I learned that this person had been addicted for almost 15 years. She was only 32. Notwithstanding that fact, the judge had enough confidence in her, enough confidence in the program that she had completed to make a personal call. He didn't have his assistant call. He called and asked for a job on her behalf. I had to have a piece of that. I had to bring that to Gary, Indiana. And so I went back and the team back at the court thought I was possessed because I said, you have to see this. We have to go to this court. We have to start one here. This is what we need in Gary, Indiana. And we went to a training. And after that training, they were sold to. As Chris said, they drank the Kool-Aid. <laughs> and as a result, we worked and planned and planned and worked. And in four months, we had a drug court in Gary, Indiana. That was September of 1996. And it has been continuing since that time. But not only did we start a court, I had the good fortune of developing curriculum for judges and prosecutors and treatment providers and court coordinators, people who thought that their role in the court system was one thing. And we developed trainings to tell them, no, it's not that. It's something totally different. We were able to work toward shifting paradigms to say to judges, you're not just there to call balls and strikes. You're there to look at ways to help people reclaim their lives. And it's re a result of some of the things that I observed and some of the training that we developed in drug court that I think could really serve us well at this critical time 
in our country. And I want to just share a few of those lessons with you. Probably one of the hallmarks of drug treatment court is getting to the root of the problem. We all know that most of the offenders in the criminal justice system have some level of involvement, many of them addiction to alcohol and other drugs. And so instead of saying, oh, we're going to send you to treatment and, and bring you back to report in two or three months without any me mechanism for accountability, The drug court model said, we're going to get to the root of the problem and ensure that you not only participate in treatment, but we're going to shore that up with self-help meetings, whether it's NA or AA or some other mechanism. And we trust you, but we're also going to require you to take regular urine tests so that we can know that that trust is well placed. And rather than have you come back in three months or four months, we want to see you every week. We want to see you every other week. Because not only do we want to make sure that you're making progress, but we want to acknowledge the progress that you're making. So as we look at our educational system that so many of us know is broken, particularly at the K-12 level, as we look at our criminal justice system, the mainstream criminal justice system, because one of the greatest challenges in the problem-solving court movement is that it doesn't reach enough people. As we look at our health care system, or the absence of one. As we look at our immigration system, if we took the time to do the analysis, to get to the root of the problem, we would be so much better served. So that's the first lesson. What else? Making a determination that everyone has a value in society. The thing that allows us to ignore so many of the challenges that we see in our country, the income inequality, the, the racism, the sexism, the treatment of people who are differently abled, is the fact that we have determined that they are, have marginal value. We've determined that certain folks are expendable. just like disposable diapers or disposable, you name it. We've decided that there are disposable people in our country. And so as a result of that, we make policies or fail to make policies because we know that we have counted a certain number of folks who it's okay with us that they don't make it. But from drug court, we learn that everybody is important. Everybody can contribute. Everyone is valuable. And whether it was from the moral position that we are all a part of creation, 
or whether it was simply the calculation of some policymakers that I would rather invest in your treatment than pay for your incarceration, the premise was that everyone has a con contribution to make to society. That could help us right now. At the same time, and, and closely related to this, to think about the cost of marginalization. What does it cost us to ignore substandard education in our urban communities? What does it cost us to ignore the fact that some people have no choice but to use emergency rooms as primary health care institutions? What does it cost us to say that the opioid epidemic is something that we can't solve or that it's just opiates now, opioids now, it was methamphetamines then, it was coke, crack cocaine another time, but that's okay, it's always something. But when you start to look at how much that costs you to make those types of decisions, then even the most prudent and most conservative policymaker has to look again. So we can learn from drug treatment courts that looking at the cost of marginalization causes us to make different decisions. The utilization of data, that's an important lesson. Not only data, but evaluation. What does recidivism look like when you allow a person to access treatment through the drug court model versus what does recidivism look like when you take the person through the traditional court system? How impactful, how effective is treatment in certain courts? How impactful, how effective is it to use your analysis. How do those things impact your community? How much value do they add in your community? What does the data say? And what do your evaluations say? Because if we look at the data, if we look at the data of how income is flatlining in many of our communities and going down for others, if we look at the data of how gun violence has increased in our communities, whether you're talking about the tragic mass shootings or the mass shootings that occur one person at a time, when you look at the data and do an analysis, whether it's a meta-analysis or just an empirical evaluation, you see that the things that we are doing over and over again are not working. So data and analysis and evaluation are also important lessons that we can learn from drug court. The final thing that I would suggest that we can learn is the value of compassion. One of the things that makes drug court so effective, that makes it work 
for the participants and for those who make up the drug court team is that there is an expectation set of success. You know those teachers in the school systems here in, in the Eugene area and even here at Lane College, you know those teachers who approach students to say, I expect you to do well in my class. I expect you to succeed. I expect that when you come in my kindergarten room, that 12 years later, you're going to walk across that stage. One of the greatest things that people who have gone through problem-solving courts, whether it's community court like you have here in Oregon or whether it's a drug treatment court for mothers whose children have been taken away or whether it's a traditional drug court for those who have been charged with crimes, they will tell you, the judge believed in me. My case manager believed in me. They wouldn't accept my excuses, when you have compassion, when you show people that you care about them, where they are in life, where they want to be, the challenges that they've experienced, and what it takes for them to overcome those challenges, and not just that you care, but you're willing to invest your time and your energy and helping them to overcome those challenges. That compassion makes a, a huge difference. Earlier, Greg talked about the fact that I ran three times before I was successful. Up until recently, I had actually lost more elections than I had won. Ran for city council two years out of law school, lost the race, ran for attorney general after being appointed and, and serving for almost a year, lost the race, ran for mayor, lost the race, ran for mayor again, lost the race. You know, I'm, I was starting to get the message. In fact, I said, if they don't want me, I'm going to be a private citizen and enjoy it. But if you want to make God laugh, tell him about your plans. <laughs> and so I had become a caregiver for my mom, my daughter and husband and I, and I was settling into what was very foreign territory because, you know, I was horrible in that biology, so there was... Really, I had no medical knowledge other than I knew when you needed to go to the doctor. But it was something that I knew I needed to do as a daughter. So I had firmly settled into that process. But folks kept coming. We've got a poll. You're the only person that can beat the incumbent, and we need a change. We need you to run. We'll get behind you this time. <laughs> I had heard that before. And so I ran. Filed later and declared later than I had ever done. Had less money because I had spent a ton of money on elections by then. And as fate would have it, we were successful. And people often ask me, what was it? What was it? Was it the old adage that the third time is a charm? Was it, what did you do differently? Did you have a different team? Did you, what did you do? And I told them, I said, you know, 
by the time I ran the third time, I was a totally different person. And they said, what do you mean? Well, the first two times, I spent time telling folks how much I could help them, how smart I was, how qualified I was, how experienced I was, all of the things that I could do and the people that I knew to help us make Gary a better place. But after taking care of my mother, after experiencing the challenges of trying to navigate a healthcare system, of talking to people in the home healthcare industry who had worked as her caregivers, seeing them being evicted from their home, seeing their children go through the school system and get expelled and suspended and go through the juvenile justice system for seemingly minor offenses. After experiencing a totally different aspect of life, even though I thought myself to be vested in and a part of the community, I was a different person, a different candidate. And someone asked me one of, at one of the last debates, what makes you different? During the 03 election, during the 07 election, I would have told them something about my degrees, my profession, all of the things that I had done. And while all of those things were true, even then, I said, I am the only person on this stage that is likely to be up to their arms in poop <laughs> at 8 o'clock in the morning. The compassion that I developed, and don't get me wrong, I wasn't a mean person, I wasn't a hard person, but when you go through that caregiving experience, it changes you. And it was that compassion that I needed to be able to serve a city that literally had gone to a level because of the population, because of the industrialization, because of all of the challenges that impact our community. That was the element that I needed. And I would suggest to you that in order for us to begin to focus as a society on the things that we have in common, on the challenges that we need to solve together, that compassion would allow us to not only look at our challenges, but look at each other in a totally different way. And we would be so much better off as a country. And so here we are. And what I would say to you is, despite all of the things that we see and hear, and despite my frustration with the same story on cable news, I am optimistic. And my optimism stems from 
the words of an old spiritual. And it simply says, I'm so glad that trouble don't last always. And the reason that it doesn't last always is because of the work that all of us are willing to do. And whether it's in education or transportation, whether it's in IT or AV or any of the other areas that we choose to endeavor. Trouble won't last always because we are willing and able about doing the work. So thank you for inviting me. I am so excited about hearing your questions. So I think there's a mic. And you just stand up? No, I'm, okay. I can hear you. You're fine. Um, as the drug person here at the college for the last 26 years, I've interfaced a good deal with uh, Judge Aiken's federal drug court. Sure. Um, and my observation wha as w while it's good to have an external hammer to reinforce recovery, um, it sometimes is also useful to kind of educate from the other end to support that recovery. Sure. Um, to that end, um, I'm kind of a skipping CD about this, as many presidents know. <laughs> but um, the state would was willing to approve us to do treatment in this setting uh, because uh, there are limitations to 12-step based treatment, one of them being it's not scientific. Right. Uh, there's lots of relapses because 12-step uh, treatment does not really get to the root of sexual, racial, class or trauma, trauma. Or, you know, veterans trauma or, you know, any of those things. And having had the experience while here of training addictions workers who were former, formerly incarcerated, former gang members, former veterans, et cetera, et cetera, I can basically see and the data support people in long-term recovery if you had uh, the right education component, which isn't necessarily present in drug courts. What, have, have, have you seen any models like that that also mandated education? Absolutely, and, and so I agree with you. So 12-step is simply an adjunct to treatment. It is not treatment, and you know that. Um, but part of what we encourage courts to teach, and you know, I could talk all, a day, all day about the importance of fidelity to the model. I mean, there are 10 key components, and um, sometimes courts don't follow those 10 key components. But education and employment and access and support of education and employment are extremely important. Some of the most successful models, in fact, oh gosh, there was um, a juvenile court that was in a, an educational setting down in the Bay Area that was very, very effective. Um, the Buffalo Treatment Court um, has a robust partnership with their local community college. So some of the more successful courts have provided access 
to education. I don't know that they always mandate. Now, what they do mandate is community service. And they also mandate completion of, of GEDs or high school educations because, you know, those are extremely important. And the thinking is if you mandate that level, people will gain this hunger for education that will serve them in the future. But no, I, I'm with you on that. I'm with you on that. Only one question? Yes, sir. Hey, Mary, thanks for coming to Eugene. Uh, Thank you. Brett Roulette, I work at the college here. I was just curious how, uh, when you had folks that would come in and they were you know, there for their weekly visit and they took a test and they failed, how would you handle that? Is it case by case or, I mean, they're already on their second chance, do you give them a third chance? Absolutely. Uh, it, 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 it was handled on a case by case basis. It was the team that came to the um, conclusion as to what to do. Although the final decision was mine, a lot had to do with what type of response is appropriate. So typically it would be a treatment response. You step up their um, weekly engagement with the treatment provider or you say, okay, well, you're going to have to test a little more often because obviously you're trying to beat the test. Um, you know, the thing that I enjoyed the most was when folks came in from a new arrest. They had not been engaged in drug court yet. And, you know, they, I would always ask them, now, if I test you right now, how are you going to test? And they would say, negative. And then I'd say, okay, we'll go back there. And they were like, go back where? <laughs> they didn't know we had an immediate way to test them. And of course, you know, their relatives or a friend or someone had tipped us off that they needed the help and they would come back and they, you know, and then they came clean. But, um, you know, typically jail is not the appropriate response to a relapsing, debilitating disease. Now, if there was deception involved, uh, for instance, uh, a guy came in and, you know, you have those little blue Crown Royal bags and had a Crown Royal bag that kind of smelled a different way and turned out he was going to bring his, someone else's urine in for the test. <laughs> and, you know, it must have been a close friend if he's carrying it like that. So it, those types of deception, uh, it, we dealt with those in a different way. But we didn't necessarily kick them out of the program. We just dealt with it and then said, okay, so now let's get back on track. Um, you know, I, I always tell folks, who hasn't met a non-compliant diabetic? Um, and we treat, we don't shun them, we don't castigate them. We say to them, hey, you know, you probably should get a Diet Coke instead of that Coke with sugar, but um, that's, you know, so that's what we often, what we still tr uh, encourage and teach in drug court. <laughs> well, we got, we, we have to, Mayor Venice. We have to have a mayor to mayor conversation. Yes, by so, all means. Uh, you know, I, it's so wonderful the work that you have done and what strikes me about this, a couple of things. First is that the judgments that we make and that get in our way of actually doing the good public policy we need because we're making judgments about the people that we're serving. Um, and the second thing is that we always tend to pick up, we're always prepared to pay at the back end of something, you know, we'll pay for the jail beds instead of paying for the prevention. And so I'm really interested in you know, how you made this come to pass and what the kind of message was to the public around it, around what was the cost and, and going forward. You know, That's how do you make that question. case for this being a good expenditure of public funds? 
First, uh, Mayor, I, I um, failed to, and, and I apologize for um, not acknowledging you earlier. I, I thank you for allowing me to come into your community, and, and thank you for the work that you do, uh, because I do hear about it, and, and I'm aware of it. Um, so we were very fortunate, and I say that because we got involved in drug courts at a time where there were only 50 in the nation, but there was this really forward-thinking attorney general who came to Washington and decided that this was something that needed to be invested in. And that was Janet Reno. And what it allowed us to do was to get the funds to start those courts and then to be able to say to our council because when um, we ran out of or when we had utilized our federal funds and we got maybe 800000 to start our court and continue it, um, by the time we got to the point that we were done with our federal dollars, our council didn't think twice about expending the money. But I'm not saying that you can't get your council or get um, other legislators at the state level or appropriators to that point without federal dollars. I think you can because what you have now are our reports, evaluations. One of the leading evaluations came out of Multnomah County for drug treatment courts. So when you provide that evidence, and you know, there are, are legislators who say, show me the money. There are council members who say, say, show me how this costs less, and you say, okay, this is what we're spending. And you know, I know that most of the jails now are county jails. We don't have many city jails. But this is what our county is spending to incarcerate people, just for 30 days, just for 60 days. Even if you don't think that we have a moral obligation to help people, why not take that $10,000, cut it in half, and spend $5,000 to get them into real treatment? Or why not take that $30,000 that you'll spend to have someone incarcerated for a year and spend ten or $15,000 to get them into treatment? And I'll even up your ante and then get them back into, into the flow of society, working and supporting their children contributing as a taxpayer, contributing to the social needs as a mentor, as someone who volunteers. All of that has a value. Let's place a value on all of that. And once you start putting numbers on things that we often take for granted, it's a no-brainer. That's why I think you've seen it was the funniest thing. So I had just lost a, a race in Indiana by two points to a Republican attorney general. Less than a month later, I am in the Rose Garden with President Bush. How'd this happen? That was something that was so bipartisan. President Clinton was a champion, President Bush was a champion, you know, and it continues. President Trump talks about drug treatment court. It must work. If all of them, if it, if it runs this spectrum, this wild spectrum, then you know that there are some um, really positive things. The thing, you know, and I'm quick to say, it is not a silver bullet. It is not this panacea uh, because, you know, you can't offer something to people and the majority of the people can't access it. You know, you can't cream. I was, um, and I, 
I may I said it earlier in in uh, a smaller setting. Um, went to one of our local prisons to give a talk for Black History Month, and um, talking to these guys, and they were from all over the state. And they, you know, there was this thing going where they kept talking about I would have gone to drug court, I couldn't get in. So finally, there's this room of 200 inmates, and I say, how many of you? applied for drug court and were denied, and half of them raised their hand. I was so ashamed. And what I said to them and what I did, and ironically, I have not heard back since. Oh, this is taped. Um, but I sent a, a note to the coordinator for our state Supreme Court and shared that with her. I said, something's wrong in Indiana. Because we are not getting, we're not creating the pipeline that need. Now, I couldn't look at them to see why they were rejected, but I knew that we should not have numbers like that. Even if half of them were legitimately denied, there should have been an opportunity for them to, uh, more of them to participate. I, that should never happen in a, in a, a setting where Folks are incarcerated. Yes, sir. Welcome to Eugene. Thank you. Um, in your experience, what and you, you spoke a little bit about uh, a judge helping someone get a job that had completed drug court. What? Um, what is a, is there a, a target range for completion? What do you feel, it, in your experience, how has that evolved over time? Are you seeing more people able to complete and then stay clean after this, or, or is that a flat, flat number? So um, generally it's about 18 months. There's some courts that are, are uh, quicker, about um, a year, and those tend to be your misdemeanor courts, but the felony courts are generally 18 to 24 months. And what we've seen, um, there was a study done uh, by the Urban Institute through the Department of Justice maybe 10 years ago. And it's, it showed that after a year, recidivism was um, as low as 28%. And even after two years, it was no higher than 40%. Now, the traditional experience is anywhere from 50 to 75, 80%. So, you know, there is a sustained period of use. The other thing that we find, and, um, and this is consistent throughout the country, that you may have someone who is kicked out of drug court. I mean, they just become impossible. But you find that because of that experience of non-use or that small period of sobriety, that they are more likely, maybe six months, maybe a year down the road, to really get into recovery and stay. So even though it's technically a drug court failure, it is not a failure to the extent that that person is now uh, not using drugs. And so there are, are um, studies and evaluations that really look at um, the lack of drug use or the reduction in drug use that comes as a result of a person participating in drug court. Yes, ma'am. I want to know if you had to think of just two things that were the biggest barriers systemically to making this um, something that we do all over the country. Um, what are they and what do you think are some ways in which we can shine a light on those to advocate, to do some advocacy for change? I would say that even though we've um, done a lot to shift 
the thinking and the paradigm of what judges, prosecutors, defenders, all of those who touch the uh, criminal justice system largely do, there is still a lot of traditional thinking. And one of the things that I'd like to see done, and um, I've really encouraged our Supreme Court justices to do, you know, once you're not practicing every day, you can have free-flowing conversations. But I've really encouraged them to make um, at least a session in the judicial education process uh, about problem-solving courts mandatory. Right now, it's an elective. You know, you can go to this session, or you can go to a session on ad adjudicating traffic tickets, or you can go to a session on evidence. I'm suggesting to courts and um, to particularly to Supreme Courts that set that curriculum, require people to go to these sessions because inevitably a light bulb goes off and they recognize, you know, gee, what I'm doing isn't working. And I'm not, you know, you will find so much professional gratification when you talk to drug court judges and say, I love it. You know, because I got so tired of doing the same thing. So I would say, one, getting people, and, and not just judges, but prosecutors, because there's still those of us who are defense attorneys who think that I'm successful when I minimize my client's contact with the law. And so you have to get that whole, and then treatment folks that say, well, I don't want anybody being mandated to come to treatment, because they have to be ready. Isn't that what folks say? Well, yeah, that's important. But a person can be more ready when they know <laughs> that if they don't do this, that the judge can, you know, address this behavior. And it helps the client. It helps. And who hasn't been, um, who hasn't accessed treatment because they've been threatened with their job? They've been threatened by a spouse or significant other. So, I mean, you know, coercion isn't just in and of itself a bad thing. So I would say, one, really getting those who are most likely to touch the, the justice system um, to think a different way. And, and the way that I think you do that is to really provide the information. Uh, the second thing that I would say is to get public policy folk who are in the appropriation business. And, and this is largely legislators, because it, at the state level, we've seen those states that have invested through their general assembly, from Louisiana to Ohio to Indiana to um, some extent those states that have made those decisions are the ones, a New York state is one, a leader. Those are the states where you see wholesale change. And so to get um, these public policy uh, makers to make that sea change to say, you know, it really is important for me to invest on the front as opposed to the back. And typically, that comes when you have legislators in positions of power who have had personal experiences. They've had a kid. They've had a neighbor. They've seen what this looks like close up. And they know, Johnny was raised to be a good guy. I know how he was raised because I was there. And lo and behold, there is this addiction that has gotten a hold of him or her. And you know what? It must be a disease because Johnny's got it now. So now I want to do something to prevent folk that I know from getting tied up. The 12 step, oh, sorry. The 12 step program, that's a part of most of the drug court requirements. 
is uh, considering the issues both with, uh, you know, effectiveness and uh, the ties into um, mandating religion in some cases. Are there any efforts to make more of a accessible part of it, um, alternative to the 12-step program? Absolutely. In fact, um, right now, there is a, um, so one, it's an adjunct, it's a support. And two, it is, um, the way that we teach it is that it be voluntary. Or in a lot of um, communities, you have 12 step, or you have a non-religious or non-spiritual alternative to 12 step. And we say whatever it is, really it's the fellowship. The fact that you can have uh, accountability partners, you can have a place to uh, in, um, seek entertainment and enjoyment and camaraderie that is not um, a group of your old friends. I mean, because you have to change your people, places, and things. And so if all of my friends are using, then I need some new friends and a new place to go. And that's really the theory behind using uh, the 12-step programs as an adjunct. But, but here's the funny thing. As, as much as um, those who are engaged in drug treatment court, uh, some of them don't want to go to the 12-step program, 12-step folks don't want them there either because <laughs> they're like, you know, this is an infringement. And, uh, and, and so we've been working really hard to bring that together to say to our 12-step, uh, you know, community that we understand and, and here's what we'll do to help and to support you in your efforts to support us. But we do think that it's important that as a person goes on this sustained journey of recovery, that they have that support mechanism. One more. Somebody said one more. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much. My name is Greg Gill. I have a question about, uh, or follow on on the education piece that you talked about earlier. Uh, when you're in the midst of a drug court, uh, you can see that it works. You're surrounded every day by uh, the people who are affected the most, the people that are in front of you. Um, city councilors, other people that are involved, they know what's going on, uh, and they see the successes. In terms of education, how do you get broader community buy-in? How do you educate the community and those other people that may or may not be affected right away by the success of the drug court, but whose buy-in is going to be absolutely necessary for um, uh, the future development and success of a, of a problem-solving court? Thank you. I always say you cannot uh, participate in a drug court graduation and be the same afterwards invite them to the graduation, just say, you know what, we've got a special program. We'd like you to come and, and just observe. And when they hear the testimonials, when they see folks that they knew weren't necessarily always looking like they look now, I think that has an impact. I think also you have to provide the statistical information. There are some people who are simply only moved by statistics. And so the data is important and keeping that data, maintaining it because a lot of courts don't necessarily compile the data uh, right away because they're afraid of it. You know, will it show that we're not successful? But if you adhere to the fidelity of the model, the success will be there. The success will be there. But I think getting people to see and sometimes you can't get them to come to you, but streaming it um, to the extent that your court rules say it's okay. And a lot of courts, even though you might not have a, an opportunity to bring cameras into a traditional courtroom, by having a separate ceremony, then you are able to expose people to the positive aspects of a court. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. My pleasure. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mayor. Wonderful, really thank wonderful. You. Really, uh, yeah. It's, uh, I've actually been to drug court graduation. I totally agree with you. Oh yeah, it's, it's not the same. Changing. It's yeah. life changing. Yeah. And you, you know, the testimonials are incredible. They really are. They really, they really are. It's, it's an incredible experience. Yeah, we um, with the the uh, National Association every year, every opening session for the last five or six years is this parade of transformation where they have people who have been involved in the court.